SJ. Welcome to Muskogee Radio, your weekly source for tribal and community news, interesting guests and discussions, plus a local events calendar. S.J. Stone Go, Gary Five Jaho Jifkados, Muskogee Radio, Mabo Hedjitowedskis. Welcome to our program. Thank you for joining us here on a beautiful, soggy, oak, moggy morning. We've got a couple things lined up in the show this uh, for for this uh, this wonderful day. Uh, we'll be talking about measles. Now we've heard it all over the news. How it's popping up in many communities around the nation. We're going to see how um, Oklahoma and the Muscogee Creek Nation is is prepared to deal with it, and uh, what sort of uh, uh, possibilities we may have for an epidemic. And learn more about it. Now, I'm sure most of us learned about it during our younger days when we encountered the thing, but that's not always the case, and that doesn't mean we're exempt, so to speak. But uh, you know, we'll we're going to find out. First of all, let me. Uh, uh, Ms. Clinton, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, let me get your name and your title here first. Uh, my name is Rachel Clinton. It's R-A-C-H-E-L, and last name is C-L-I-N-T-O-N, and I'm an epidemiologist at the Oklahoma State Department of Health. And joining us here in the studio is Dr. Monica Kidwell from the uh, uh, Muscogee Creek Nation Department of Health. Uh, Ms. Kidwell, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you. You being with us, I'm glad to be here. the um, topic of measles has been, uh, for me, has been a little disturbing. And the fact that I thought we were done with it, and I think most people still kind of think that way, but it's not the case. We're seeing outbreaks pop up in several places around the country for a lot of different reasons. Uh, first of all, um, 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 Ms. Clinton, let me ask you, uh, are, we, are we looking at a possibility of some sort of epidemic, and do you have any numbers of uh, people being affected either here or uh, around the country? Yeah, that's a great question. So currently in Oklahoma during 2019, we, we have not had any cases, confirmed cases of measles in Oklahoma. But as you mentioned, we are seeing outbreaks um, worldwide in other countries that are being imported into the U.S. And then we are seeing uh, quite a few outbreaks occurring across the United States, um, primarily that has started in New York City among the Jewish Orthodox community. So that's one of the largest outbreaks. Um, but as of May 3rd, since January 1st this year, we have uh, 764 cases across the United States, confirmed cases of measles, and that's in 23 states. Um, you know, it's important to understand that this is the, the greatest number of, of measles cases that um, have been reported since 1994 um, and since the disease was really considered eliminated in 2000. So it is a, it is a big concern at this time. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Kid, uh, Dr. Kidwell, uh, what are we seeing here in Muskogee country or in our area? Uh, at this point, excuse me, at this point there haven't been any confirmed cases and um, we have not, I think, in any of our clinics seen any suspected cases um, either. Um, though there are cases as near as that have been reported in states as close as Missouri and Texas so we have to always stay vigilant because it could be brought in at any point. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big questions that uh, many people have, including yours truly, is that uh, as a kid we got vaccinated for all kinds of things. And I remember actually having measles as a child. Uh, does that exempt me from any uh, worries that I might have about uh, the situation today, Miss uh, um, Clinton? Yeah, so, uh, for, you know, there's there's kind of two levels of uh, recommendations for it to make sure that you're protected against measles. And so for the general population, if you're born prior to 1957, you know, the assumption is that you probably did have the disease as a child, which does offer lifelong immunity. Um, so that's for most of those persons in that age group. It's not a concern. 
um, for persons that are born after 1957, um, in the general population, it's recommended for adults that they have at least one documented MMR or laboratory evidence that they're immune. Um, and then for children, uh, for children that are school-age children or adults that work in high-risk settings, for example, um, colleges, universities, healthcare personnel, and anyone that does any traveling um, outside of the U.S., they're recommended to have two doses of MMR. Um, okay, um, Dr. Kidwell, the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation is a tribe that gets. You know, and families together a lot, a lot of community of events. And the phrase tightly knit is uh, comes to mind. I'm not sure that's entirely applicable, but uh, we, you know, we're always uh, seeing folks a whole lot more than I think in the more dominant society. Now, does that present a, a situation where some sort of a communicable disease like this is uh, more likely to, uh, to kind of break loose? Certainly, um, it, with, with large gatherings, um, if there's an outbreak, that can certainly raise the possibility of, of easy transmission. Measles is very easily transmitted um, in an unimmunized population. Um, it has about a 90 percent, um, if you get exposed, about there's about a 90 percent chance that you will actually come down with the measles. Um, fortunately, we do maintain um, pretty good immunization rates. Um, within the Muskogee Creek Nation. Um, I can't tell you right off the top of my head exactly what our current rates are, um, but we do keep an eye on that. And, um, and as long as we maintain good immunization rates, then even with um, various gatherings, um, different things with lots of people, um, the population should stay healthy. So we shouldn't have to worry about attending a wild onion dinner. Right. You <laughs> should be able to attend, to, to attend the wild onion dinner, attend the stomp dances, and um, but we do want to maintain um, high immunization rates in our communities to help protect because the vaccine is very, very effective. Uh, Ms. Clinton, uh, do you have any uh, uh, numbers or anything, uh, status of the, of the entire state? Um, in terms of vaccination coverage? Yeah, uh, are we doing pretty well? Uh, Oklahomans kind of uh, uh, realizing the, the need to do this. Uh, do you have something uh, you can point to there? Sure, there's, there's a couple sources. So um, for children, we, we do an annual kindergarten survey, and so we do assess at, at that, that age group. And for adults, it's not something that we have complete data, but we do in Oklahoma, for the most part, have pretty good coverage. Um, you know, enough coverage for the most part that we're going to have some herd immunity. We do know that there are certain pockets in the state um, where levels are below what they should be, what's recommended. And we do know here in Oklahoma and across the U.S. that there is, and that's one of the concerns that CDC has, is there is a growing trend, especially with the younger uh, population and younger mothers, to not vaccinate. Um, so we do know that, that that's where the concern is, and that's where we want to place a large emphasis that if you are in one of those communities where you know that the majority of the children or adults are not vaccinated, um, that that's something to really think about um, in this time where measles can be so easily imported um, into the United States. And so overall, we have we have good coverage um, but, but there, are, there can be pockets, and, you know, what that means is if you do have a case and it's in a susceptible population, meaning you do have even a small group in a community that's not up to date, that can fuel a local outbreak. Um, uh, let's talk about an outbreak. Um, I understand this uh, particular disease is highly communicable. Is, is that the case? Uh, um, Dr. Kidman? Yes, it, it is very highly communicable. Um, measles is actually an airborne, is, is transmitted through airborne through very small droplets. Those droplets will stay in the air um, for up to two hours after an infected person has been in a room. Um, so it's very easy. We, we have to take um, appropriate isolation precautions at the clinics if someone comes in with a suspected case of measles. We actually have a reverse flow, like a reverse flow isolation room that we would bring them in from an outside door, put them in that room, um, and then appropriately um, gown, mask, all of that to, to, and then clean the room after they leave to help prevent um, further spread. 
So it is, it's important if somebody has a rash, a fe high fever, rash illness that they're suspecting might be the measles, that they let us know that before they come into the clinic so that we can give them appropriate um, instructions as to where they need to come in, what they need to do, um, so that we can take appropriate precautions and not have our facilities be where it's spreading mm -hmm. to other, other susceptible people. Not everybody can be immunized. Um, not everybody, um, while the vaccine's very effective, there is a, you know, a small number of people who don't get complete immunity from it. Um, and then people with, um, that are, have immunosuppression, um, young children under a year of age, they don't get their first vaccine until they're 12 months. Um, so there's a, there definitely are always going to be people who medically can't or not appropriate for vaccine at that time that would be susceptible. Um, okay, um, uh, Ms. Clinton, ha has the state uh, taken some sort of approach? Uh, have you seen uh, situations uh, where uh, uh, possible spread, an epidemic uh, could be happening or something people should look out for? Um, yeah, so, you know, like I said, so measles, it's, I think it's important for persons to understand that measles, either uh, suspected cases or confirmed cases, are reportable to the state health department. So usually those are, we're notified immediately if there's a suspect case. Um, so far this year, again, we have not had any confirmed. We've had, of course, we do have a lot of consultations and a lot of our healthcare staff are watching very closely. Um, and so that process is, is kind of occurring. Um, Sorry, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're now we're just trying to drink it all in. Now, have, has, have you got a plan in place? Has there been a strategy developed in case uh, it does come in? Sure. Yes, and I'm so sorry about that. I just had a temporary issue where I wasn't able to hear. So, yeah, so it is a reportable condition. And, um, you know, last year we did have three case, We did have three confirmed cases of measles in Oklahoma, three different counties. And so... Um, it is something that we do have a plan in place. We're, we're trained. Last year we did have um, three pretty large, you know, each case of measles is considered an outbreak, and it often is a very extensive follow-up. You know, of course, we work to exclude the case and make sure that the close contacts are managed and excluded appropriately. But oftentimes in measles we have a very large number, hundreds, you know, sometimes as close to a 1,000 number of persons that have been exposed. And so um, it is part of our normal investigation and control processes at the State Health Department to work with the local health care provider and the local health jurisdiction or tribal group to make sure that, you know, we investigate all potential persons that have been exposed. With measles, we have an option where we're able to, um, if we have an exposure in a person that is susceptible, meaning that they um, have not been exposed to the disease or they're not vaccinated, we have a 72-hour window where we can actually administer an MMR vaccination. So that's one control method that's used. Um, but in terms of the investigation and control, it really comes back to it's reportable. We monitor it very closely. One case is automatically moved into sort of an immediate investigation and control efforts. And, um, you know, we're also doing a lot of outreach statewide. Uh, we just recently released a, a health alert network that went to all health care providers across the state just to give guidance on recommendations for health care providers for immunization Um we also have done a general press release that's gone out to the community that talks about there's a lot of questions I think persons have about um, am I protected or what do I what do I need to do to make sure that I'm protected and so doing press releases and then also engaging with our local health jurisdictions to make sure that they have the resources as well and um, so at this time we haven't had any but we do have systems in place and, and like I said last year we did have three confirmed cases and the thing that's important to understand as well is one case, just like Dr. Kidwell had mentioned, measles is so highly contagious that just for one case, you know, you may have hundreds of people exposed. And so um, the investigation of going back and looking at all the exposed persons and evaluating to determine their risk and continuing to monitor them for weeks after, um, that's all part of that um, kind of outbreak investigation and control that we would do at the state um, in coordination with the local health jurisdiction. Um, that raises uh, kind of an off-the-wall question in my mind. So if uh, someone were infected uh, in the early stages and couldn't really detect what was going on with them, would they be uh, in a position where, say, if that person went to church or uh, you know, a basketball game or something like that, uh, and uh, uh, contamination, I mean, is, could the whole hall then be... Uh, under possible uh, quarantine or whatever? 
Yeah, um, so, you know, with measles, a person is infectious four days prior to the onset of the rash until four days after the onset of the rash. And because, like Dr. Kidwell mentioned, it's so highly infectious that the virus, when a person coughs or sneezes in their environment, the virus can actually stay suspended even after a person leaves the room for up to two hours. And so what we know from previous investigations we've had here in Oklahoma is that um, Persons oftentimes, you know, may not feel well, but they continue to go to their local grocery store. They'll go to church. Um, sometimes they're going to work, and so that can result in a very large number of contacts. Now, we know the majority of persons are up to date here in Oklahoma. However, the concern is for, again, you know, those children that are too young to be immunized or persons maybe that um, have chosen not to, um, and those are the concerns um, where transmission could occur. Um, Dr. Kidwell, you've been nodding your head here uh, <laughs> as, as she responded. Uh, do we have situations that uh, would raise concern? Because, you know, basketball is a huge sport. Uh, you know, churches are, are, are well attended usually. Well, I think any of those. I mean, any of those venues are venues that could certainly be where, if there's a case that um, that are there and during the infectious phase of it, could be a, could be an area that it could be spread. Um, People don't necessarily recognize it these days very easily um, because it has been um, back when, before the vaccine, before the vaccine was developed in the early 60s, um, everybody knew what measles looked like because everybody had the measles, mm -hmm. pretty much. Including yours. <laughs> so um, in the years since then, as immunization rates got better and better, um, leading up to the de declaration that it was eradicated in, two in the U.S. in 2000, you know, young physicians haven't seen it. Even older physicians like myself frequently haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, be simply because we trained during an age that it was, there, there just weren't a lot of cases of it. There, you know, three cases in the state of Oklahoma last year confirmed cases. I didn't see any of those three cases. <laughs> oh, thank God. Thank God. Um, are creeks immune? <laughs> no, I no, no creeks are not immune, and um, and of course we know that that Native Americans as a whole have a, a troubled past history with various infectious mm -hmm. diseases like yeah. measles. Um, currently, fortunately, because it is a community that I think has been mostly good about it, about immunizing about taking that advice and not um the, we've got pretty good immunity mm -hmm. so built up but um but it doesn't take but the immune but the the rates of immunization only have to drop a few percentage points sometimes to reach a threshold where herd immunity doesn't protect everybody anymore uh, let's uh let's tackle the uh the question that is the uh 800 pound gorilla here uh, why is this happening I mean uh, you hear the term anti-vaxxers and uh, uh, to some extent you know religious exemptions or people just say you can't tell me what to do you know that kind of thing is that are these the kind of things that are really uh, uh, assisting in the, in the spread of the disease it really does um, there are a lot of there are um, a lot of young parents who, um, because they've grown up in a time when these illness, when these Ill different um, illnesses that we protect against vaccines, they've never seen them. Um, their parents may have never seen them. They um, so they develop a perception that's that is. It, there's a lot of misinformation out there on the internet and they develop a perception that the vaccine itself is more dangerous than the disease it protects against. Like um, causing autism. Like, like people thinking that, like, that, like there having been um, a report potentially linking um, the MMR vaccine with autism. Now that report has been completely debunked. Um, that physician who, who did that, that study, that study has been retracted from the the journal it was he lost his medical license in Great Britain because um, he basically the study was fraudulent mm -hmm. and um, but that did a lot of harm to and to our levels of immunity with people being afraid of particularly of the MMR vaccine um, some people have a perception that 
well, the, it's just that the drug companies are making lots of money on vaccines and it's all just a conspiracy to mm -hmm. make money for the drug companies and the doctors. So, uh, yeah, the drug companies don't pay us to <laughs> give <laughs> the vaccines. They, for the most part, don't make, that mu don't make a lot of money on particularly older vaccines mm -hmm. like the MMR. Uh, Ms. Clinton, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so, you know, Dr. Kidwell makes just excellent points. The only thing that I would add additionally, I think that, and, and we see this with other infectious diseases, if you think about Zika, which was in the news, or Ebola, you know, I think we're also in an age now where people in the United States travel um, way more frequently out of the country than we've seen in previous decades, um, whether that's just, you know, going to Mexico, um, sometimes for just a short trip, or truly traveling, you know, further distances into Europe. And it, it's kind of twofold there because, one, you know, I always say you can be on a plane and across the world in a day. And, and what I think with that increased travel and the um, speed at which people can do that, that further fuels it. The other issue that we're having, similar to what we're seeing in the United States, is in other countries, um, the reason these cases are actually being imported into the U.S. is because there's very large outbreaks in other countries, Israel, the Philippines, really all over the world. They're also experiencing the same trends where there's a lack of vaccination in those countries. And for that reason, they're having large outbreaks, which means that then that's allowed an opportunity for more and more of these to be imported into the U.S. And so that's the other challenge, I think, looking at a worldwide perspective versus the U.S., is that's another challenge we have is we have a lot of people that travel, which is really why it's so important, especially if you're traveling with an adult and you're not sure if they're vaccinated or if you have a child less than 12 months, they can still get the vaccine prior to travel. It doesn't count as a valid dose, but as long as they're six months of age, they are able to get a vaccine. And that's an issue that, that we're seeing that sometimes parents aren't aware of before they travel is make sure that your children are vaccinated if they're at least six months. But that's, that's kind of the issue worldwide that we're seeing is that other countries are also experiencing very large outbreaks due to um, a decrease in the amount of persons that are being vaccinated. That raises a couple of things in my mind then. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, uh, I think we're approaching the, the, the travel season where a lot of people will be taking vacations and uh, getting to uh, countries around the, around the globe that uh, would be in these situations. And then uh, when you come home, you're in this big silver tube flying through the air and uh, you're pretty much contained. And if someone does have the the problem there, then would that be a higher potential for contamination? Uh, either one of you. Please. Yes, that absolutely airline travel would be. Um, it's a very closed space with a lot of people in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can see here at the, we have a system in place, uh, and that's a, a, another really great point. Um, just being in an airport is also going to increase that, just because we know there's such an opportunity for, for persons from all over the world to be in that location. And, you know, we do have a system, all the states have a system with CDC where if we do have a confirmed case on a flight or, or a confirmed case that has had any air travel during their um, infectious period, the um, they basically pull that flight manifest and any residents are notified. So, for example, we do get periodic flight notifications, um, and sometimes that is, you know, that that can be a source of exposure. So it's another important thing for people to think, even if you're not going out of the country but you're flying across, it does um, also increase that likelihood, whether it's a, a child or adult that's uh, susceptible. And that's a really important point that we see as well. And sometimes there's even been outbreaks where just persons that work at the airport alone um, are actually exposed to it. So it's really important for me, people to make sure that they're up to date. Yeah. Uh, let me throw out a, a question that I think may be border on the ridiculous here, but uh, uh, we've seen movies like Outbreak and Contagion where there's this huge, massive governmental response to a disease, you know, National Guards out and uh, Red Cross everywhere and that kind of thing. Uh, with measles, do you, are we facing the same kind of situation, uh, potential fatalities or uh, wildfire kind of spread? Uh, 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 Ms. Goodwill? Uh, certainly while it can, I think that we have high enough immunization rates still that the likelihood of that kind of huge disaster scenario is is probably not, not something we have to worry about extensively. However, certainly all the emergency management, um, all the emergency management services through Greek Nation, the state, the counties, 
um, they do trainings for that type of, for managing that type of emergency as well as other types of, you know, weather, fire types of emergencies, so. Ms. Clinton, does the state uh, have, have any ideas in, in that regard? Yeah, so that's part of our uh, preparedness and response plan is that, um, you know, measles is, um, at least for most of the epidemiologists, you know, it's something that we, we do work with our local health jurisdictions to make sure for, for other rash illnesses as well as enteric infections that we all are trained. And whether it's a foodborne outbreak or if we had a rash illness, um, we already have outbreak response plans in place. Um, again, there's training about the disease. We work closely with immunization service to always assess our statewide level at the number of vaccinations that we have on hand, which in an outbreak setting, we can actually designate those to be used for outbreak purposes. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration. Um, on a, a one on the, on the prevention side or kind of preparedness right now as we're looking at it. Um, and then also once we, if we did get into that situation where we have ongoing transmission, meaning it's not just a local outbreak anymore, um, yeah, there's definitely systems in place and it, it is a large um, coordination effort. You know, it's from the healthcare perspective of the proper evaluation, isolation and control um, of, the, of the patient. It's making sure we do appropriate testing. Um, there's a lot of different, and then depending on the high-risk setting, there's a lot of, um, we already have plans in place. For example, if we have a daycare, which often can fuel an outbreak, or if it's in a healthcare setting, we do have those plans written up um, already and are trained on those. Um, kind of to, and, and the only thing I would add additionally is I think, unfortunately, we, you know, kind of the thought is that um, Hopefully there will be a, be a trend where people will start to try to become more educated on the topic and make sure that, you know, they're really thinking before they travel. Um, but I think we are in a situation right now, like Dr. Kidwell said, most of the time with, with measles, it's, it's a lower risk for, for deaths and severe complications. That can happen in about one out of every thousand cases. Um, but I do think if, you know, as time moves forward, especially with the outbreaks occurring in other countries and what we're seeing in the U.S., um, especially with some of the movements to, to still not move forward with, you know, appropriate vaccination and, and things like that and exemptions, we can eventually end up in a place where it will be similar to what is before it was eliminated, which means that we'll have continuous ongoing transmission similar to how it was before, you know, the vaccine was introduced. So I don't think we're at that place now, and hopefully with, you know, continued discussion and education, that's something that we can prevent from happening. But I think right now it is a concerning situation that, um, you know, in coming years that, that could possibly become a reality. And the important thing, I think, for persons to understand is, you know, with measles, people think, well, it's a pretty self-limiting illness. Most people recover. I mean, there can be severe complications in children less than five and adults over 20. Um, there can be permanent hearing loss. There can be encephalitis, although that's, again, about one in every thousand cases. But it's important to understand every measles case requires a significant amount of work not only for a healthcare facility, um, it can be very costly for the healthcare system and for the patient, um, it can be time off work, but it's also for all of the health jurisdictions and states, it's also a lot of um, time and effort that's spent in the control. And so that it's very taxing on the public health infrastructure as well to have continued cases. And so um, those are some of the major concerns kind of going forward. Let me uh, toss another one out here. Um does as this disease does it uh, evolve we've heard of other other diseases that uh, uh, where vaccines and preventive measures uh, are no longer quite as effective because the thing is i guess mutated somewhat uh, uh, is that the case with with measles no that doesn't seem to really be the case with measles like it is with influenza for instance yeah. so the vaccine that we've had since the 1960s is still a very effective vaccine. It still provides a very high level of protection. Yeah, Ms. Clinton, uh, does the state kind of keep a, uh, a storehouse of this sort of thing uh, around and make it available? Um, so in, the, in regards to measles too, and um, so like Dr. Kidwell was saying, the vaccine is highly effective and, and that's a really common question we have. A lot of the strains so anytime we have a confirmed case, the state health department, we work with uh, CDC and our reference lab to do higher level of testing. And so we know there's different genotypes or essentially different types of measles that circulates around the world. 
Um, and we do like to do testing on any confirmed case to trace it back to the country of origin so that we do know specifically. But the shot is effective for all of those. And so I think that's important for people to understand. No matter where you travel, that vaccine will, will be protective, whether it's here in the United States or outside of that. Um, and then in terms of uh, so measles, you know, there's no specific treatment. It's just supportive care. I think that's important for persons to understand. It just there's, There is no treatment for it, which is one of the reasons that we do recommend vaccination. And then here we don't necessarily keep that on hand. Um, you know, we do have, of course, the um, immunizations that are kept um, across across the state that's in different locations. But um, in terms of mutation, it's not something that we typically see with measles. Uh, pandemic flu is kind of similar to what you're describing. In those situations, we would be concerned about like a high mutation rate. Um, but typically with measles, what we've seen, you know, even going back the last five years is that most of these measles cases are being identified in the United States. When we do um, a higher level of testing, we're able to trace it back to types that we normally see circulating around the world. So we don't have any concerns right now that anything's changed um, in terms of the, you know, the measles virus itself. Well, that's, that's nice to know it's not like a growing, evolving monster. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, this uh, in the last few minutes here. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, uh, red flags or warning signs or signals that people should be aware of when they may uh, suspect that they've encountered and uh, uh, now infected by a case of measles. Now, what uh, what kinds of things should we be looking for? So the the typical symptoms with the measles are it will typically start with a high fever along with cough, runny nose, and red watery eyes. Um, that usually that that phase you know lasts about two to three days at that point you may see little white spots in the back of the throat or on the roof of the mouth those are called coplic spots um, and then within a day or so of that then people start breaking out in the rash the rash usually starts at the top of the head and moves down to the trunk and then out to the arms and legs so that's a pretty characteristic thing it's um starts as um flat red spots, but they can become raised. And um, there's a lot of pictures out there on the internet that the pictures of what the, what the rash looks like, but it does have a kind of a ter characteristic spread and a characteristic pattern of fever along with the respiratory symptoms and the, the, red, the red watery eyes then followed by the rash, mm -hmm. usually three to five days after the onset of fever. What should someone do then uh, when they think that they have uh, been infected? Well, they should they should call their health care provider. Um, they should let them know that they that they suspect that they might have the measles, so that they can be appropriately um, so that they can be appropriately isolated um, if they come into the facility. Um, as Ms. Clinton said, there is no specific treatment for it, but identification I think is important to identify those cases so that we can so that tracking can can happen. So. Um, but I would advise that they let the let their clinic, let their um, primary care provider know what they think they have before they come in, so that they can, um, so the facility can take appropriate precautions as well to to limit the spread within the facility. So don't and contaminate the clinic. Right. right. Try not to contaminate. So we can try not to contaminate the clinic. We can bring them in um, through the isolation entrance. Put them in an isolation room. Mm -hmm. Um, handle that appropriately. Um, I, I heard a thing on the radio the other day where they were talking in some areas where there were clinics that didn't have isolation rooms and they had doctors, and this was not in Oklahoma, this is in one of the other states where they've had cases and they were literally going out and the doctors were like going out of the clinic and looking at them, I don't know, in their car, on the street, <laughs> I'm not sure if that was kind of an interesting the cone of thought, yeah. but, but trying to not bring them into the clinic because they didn't have appropriate isolation okay. facilities. A uh, so. final question to you, Ms. Clinton. What, uh, what information would the state want when uh, there might be a suspected case? Yes, that's a great question. So um, at the State Health Department, we have a 24-hour number um, for those type of situations. So, And we do take a lot of consultations um, from ERs, county health departments, clinics, urgent cares. If a, And it could be both from the general public, you know, if they know that they have recently um, traveled or have potentially contact with a person maybe in another state that's symptomatic and they're suspecting, um, they're always free to call and we can kind of guide them um, on next steps. If they do have a provider like Dr. Kidwell had mentioned, um, that's kind of what's recommended is to please call ahead and notify an ER uh, 
county health department clinic because they do have steps like she described where we just want to avoid them um you know being in the clinic um for health care providers um we did just send out a, a health alert network statewide and that goes, goes to all nurse practitioners pas physicians in all different settings and in there it kind of details a lot of the information so we have a, an algorithm that essentially um you know, describes if the patient meets these types of symptoms and this type of a history, please notify us. And what we like to air the state health department, what we will work to do is we'll kind of do an assessment and based off the information there, you know, their exposure history along with are they vaccinated or not, along with the symptoms, we kind of determine how high risk they are. And for the most high risk, we like to hear about those because one, we can assist in making appropriate recommendations for exclusion from school, work, daycare, but also we like to ensure why we have the patient in the clinic we can assist with getting um, confirmatory testing. So there's additional lab tests that we can um, run here at the State Health Department or our reference lab at CDC um, to get to get more specific results. And so okay. um, now, we would just encourage. Yeah, oh, let me okay. interrupt you there. Um, sure. How how would they get in touch with you? What's your phone number there? Um, our number, it's our EPI on call number, is the four zero five two seven one four zero six zero. Okay, and then, of course, you've got a website with this information also, right? Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. All right, uh, um, <clears throat> Dr. Kidwell, how would uh, someone here in the Creek Nation obtain this information from uh, the local uh, Department of Health here? Um, well, the Department of Health does have a website, um, and that does have the phone numbers for all the individual clinics. Um, and to be able to get a hold of somebody at one of the clinics, we do have public health nurses as well at the clinics that... Um, should also um, know who to get in touch with. Okay, and is there a phone number there again? A central phone number? Yeah. No. All right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm sure they, they'll find you. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Clinton. We appreciate you taking time to, to chat with us this morning. And uh, uh, Dr. Kidwell, thank you so much for making time from your schedule. Uh, we're going to take a short pause here, and then we're going to talk about football, one of the state's almost religions here, and how some uh, Muskogee Creek kids can take part in some camps. So please stay with us here on Muskogee Radio, here on The Brew. I started doing it when I was 11. I wanted to be just like my big brother. And some of my friends were already doing it. We got hooked fast. I just can't get enough. I'm Jacob, and I'm addicted to playing the drums. There's lots of stuff that makes it cool to be native. Doing meth isn't one of them. Find something better to do. Check out NCAI.org. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Who am I? Am I native? I don't want people assuming things because I'm Indian. I just want to be me. But how do I live in two worlds? Some guys just check out by doing meth. But that ain't for me. Because I see my family, my friends, my drum making, my future. There are a lot of cool things about being who I am. And meth isn't one of them. Learn more at NCAI.org. A message from the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and the National Congress of American Indians. Welcome back to Muskogee Radio here on uh, The Brew. 12.40 a.m. and 106.3 f.m. Uh, joining us now in our studio, we have um, Ms. Uh, Sandra Golden, and a name many of you might recognize, Mr. Thomas Lott. Uh, thank you all for making time to come in, and we appreciate you, you know, coming in to, to chat about uh, one of Oklahoma's almost religions, football. Okay, try that one again. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, it helps if I push the right button. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, flyer has been advertising a uh, Muskogee Creek Nation football camp for 2019. Uh, Ms. Golden, maybe you can start there for us and kind of let us know what it's all about. Um, well, actually, this is our ninth year doing this uh, in, in partnership with the Muskogee Creek Nation. And it is a camp designed for young students, uh, first grade through the 12th, to learn principles of football. And we have a number of coaches that we put together, thanks to Thomas Lott. 
to uh, teach our kids. It's a one-day camp, and this year we're doing five one-day camps. All right, now these will be uh, happening in June, correct? Yes, the first one is June the 7th, and that would be with uh, Kawita. The second one is June the 8th, that would be with um, Muskogee. The next three, the first, well, June the 13th is at Eufaula, June the 14th is at Okima, and June the 15th is at Bristow. All right, uh, Coach Lott, uh, that's a name that uh, many Oklahomans are familiar with. Uh, maybe you want to take a second there and remind us about your, your career. Well, I was very fortunate. Um, I was a high school All-American that traveled through Austin, uh, the University of Texas hater, but uh, <laughs> I came to the University of Oklahoma, played for Barry Switzer. We won national championships, uh, conference championships, uh, uh, went to bowl games. It was quite an experience for me coming from San Antonio uh, to be able to utilize my ability to play sports and give me an opportunity to travel and learn things from not only in this country, but out of this country also. And with that being said, I feel like there are so many young men and young ladies that if they had the same opportunity, it would be something that's priceless for them to uh, get an education and not only learn things that are outside of their comfort zone, which is their family and friends in their neighborhood, but it's invaluable for them to have an opportunity to travel and go to different states and, like I said, leave the country and learn things from people all over. And I was fortunate enough to do that. Okay, Ms. Um, Ms. Golden, now this camp is kind of aimed at uh, uh, a, kind of a specific group of uh, football uh, wannabes kind of thing. Uh, the kids in the city get a lot of opportunities to do this sort of thing, but oh. uh, you're looking at something else there. Yes, when we first started, it uh, it came to, of course, I'm from a small rural community in Wilika, and it just, you know, one of the things that I saw was that there were lots of opportunities for students who were in larger schools and larger metropolitan areas. In our rural areas, we, we just don't have a lot of resources. And, uh, you know, the, the kids that were playing uh, on the football team, the, the, they played offense and defense. And if one of them got hurt, that was like the end of their, their season because they didn't have enough players. And they, they had camps in, in the universities, different places, but they cost lots of money. And what I envision for these, these kids is football's everything in some of these schools. So someone has to teach them. Uh, coaches don't have a lot of resources. So we, we just looked at how could we bring something to the table for these kids in our community and help the families that want to support their children. Right, yeah. Football is kind of a social status uh, symbol for, in many of these schools. Now, uh, Mr. Lott, uh, what will you be uh, bringing to these camps? What are you going to teach these kids? Well, my whole uh, mission has always been for years. I've been coaching for 35 years, high school level, semi-pro, a lot of youth. I like to work with the youth. Like I said, I designed a program to increase quickness, speed, agility, and balance. And I wanted it to be those four areas so that we wouldn't just concentrate on football. Um, football is a specialist sport and it's not for everyone. And you look at the um, where our society is now, a lot of parents are afraid of having their kids playing football. But I always encourage them to get them involved in something athletically to help develop their bodies. So I'm hoping that we can increase this uh, opportunity that we have with the football part of things and add some, some basketball and some uh, training as far as to be athletes in the future 
so that we can get people involved that aren't just football players. Now, you mentioned some things there like uh, quickness and speed that uh, are not necessarily, uh, uh, let me put it this way, you're not just looking at the collision of big, huge bodies and a lot of weight. You're trying to teach some other things there that will be of use on the field, right? Well, it's it's one thing that I always tell people. I My whole way of saying things is I try to improve power the mind through the body mm -hmm. so I take the body train the body how to uh, when it's hurt how to heal teach these kids how to use their bodies till its fullest so no matter what they choose to do they're in great shape and and conditioned mentally to be able to take on what's going on in our society okay and uh, it says here on the flyer you, you'll uh They'll be learning football fundamentals and uh, develop the physical skills for the game. So that's that's what you're going to be sharing. With. Definitely. All right, uh, uh, Ms. Golden. As as we look at uh, these possibilities here for kids to uh, uh, gain these skills and possibly develop them for to to help them in their educational process. Uh, what kinds of things then uh, do you want to uh, see? Uh, I see that it's open to all students grades 1 through 12. Now that's a pretty big uh, range there. Yes, uh, the, the coaches uh, separate them into age groups. So the older kids, if they're like 17, 16 years old, they're not doing the same thing as the first and second graders. Mm -hmm. But they, the coaches work with them at their age, age level. And some of the kids, you know, their school is about football. Everything's about football. And they, when they come out, they don't, they don't know anything. Um, I had one student, uh, this was years ago, uh, he was 11 and he came out and his parents had done everything for him. You know, they wanted him to play some kind of sport because being at home on his phone, on the computer, yeah. the, on the games, mm -hmm. that's all he was doing. And he was a little bit chubby and he really actually wanted to play but he wanted to know what he was doing so after a day at the camp he came and he was just grinning from ear to ear and he said now i know what to do so i can play little league football because mm -hmm. you know the the parents they wanted him to play but there were some basic fundamentals about the game that he didn't know what you know you were going how you dress what you do where you go things like that and playing with other kids I think uh, he, he felt confident enough after that that he could go out for football and, and uh, he did yeah. uh, so you know the the thing the other part of it is that the parents come out to support their, their kids Great. and a lot of them will bring their tents and they'll they'll come out all day long just to watch them you know do what they're doing and support them and and it's uh, it's a really good thing for families to be able to support they, they know how to do it now mm -hmm. and the communities we also partner with the Indian communities at, at these different schools. So they come out as well and indirectly, I think, the, uh, the, the, our, our kids are in the community and the community supports the football team, they work with the school, and it just makes for a, a better idea for, for kids in the community. They have the whole school, the whole community in their support. So when we send them off, to a, a, a larger school, maybe they go to OU, maybe they go to a smaller school like uh, NSU and Tahlequah, but they, they still have that support from their community. We, we really want our kids to succeed in education, but we know that if they're in a, if they're in a, a they're on a team, they're, they're more likely to do better. Are you kind of underlining the educational aspect of this? Cause you, know, you go to college, you're not there just to play football, uh, although so many, I guess some people do think that way, but you have an opportunity to gain an education and get a step up on whatever you uh, have designed for the rest of your life. I mean, you guys deal, make sure that these kids understand that too. Oh, that's one thing that I preach from the very beginning is knowledge is, is really the power. And the more you learn and the more you know is what makes you valuable in our society all over the world. So being able to play a sport kind of opens up 
the doors for you to get out because let's face it you only you only know what your environment teaches you so if you get an, an opportunity to broaden your environment that gives you an opportunity to learn more things in in all over this country all over the world and I, I I'm an example of that mm -hmm. you know I have a lot of guys that I grew up with they never left their community never left our neighborhood let me, yeah, let me ask you this. Uh, forgive me for interrupting no, you. No, no problem. Um, you can't be a dumb person, uh, really, and, and play football because there's a lot of uh, complicated things you have to learn. Even uh, uh, a receiver has to learn you know, the patterns and uh, the signals and everything else. And, of course, the quarterback has to learn all of this stuff. So uh, you've got to have something going on between your ears there to, to really be an effective player, right? Absolutely. But sports, period, is like mm -hmm. that. It's so, you know, it, it's so important. You learn time management. You learn how to uh, deal with ups. You learn how to deal with downs. I mean, you're going to lose. Sooner or later, you're going to lose. I teach my athletes you have to lose with class as well as win with class. Um, the mental part of things are what people really don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many small details that you have to learn right. and you have to know. Uh, from day to day, you're constantly learning and situations are being brought in front of you and you have to learn how to adapt and how you're going to deal with, how you're going to overcome these situations. So you're absolutely right. A lot of people that have never really played sports, they do think it's a bunch of dumb jocks, but they don't realize the mental demands that you have being an mm -hmm. athlete. And as you move up, then it gets more demanding. Right. Um, you mentioned safety a little earlier. Now, uh, Ms. Golden, uh, what are you all doing to uh, ensure that these camp participants will be in a safe spot? I mean, people are talking about injuries and uh, helmet uh, concussion kind of thing and spearing people. Uh, um, what are you doing to keep them safe? Well, actually, we, we, we don't ha we have the kids just to wear their play clothes and, you know, shoes. Uh, not they don't have to wear spikes or anything to come out and play but we we teach them the fundamentals that you know how to even how to run how to fall how to hit somebody if you're going to hit them to keep from hurting them and yourself that was like i said earlier a real concern because you know and the rules change you know uh over the the years the the, uh, the coaches I listen to them tell the kids and, sh and they show them uh, different things and I'm saying, oh well, gosh, I didn't really know that if, you, uh, you, if you're going to go and get somebody on defense, you can't go with your head. You've got to use your shoulder and your body, you know, and a lot of kids don't know that. But if they learn it early, they learn it early and then they, 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 they go and they play on Little League and then they play in school, they already know that. And some of the kids are afraid. Well, I wanted to play, but I was afraid I would get hurt, I'd get mm -hmm. hit. And now they know. So that instills the, the confidence in them. And, you know, and they, they, other kids, they talk to them about it. So the coaches are, the, we've, most of them have been with us uh, at least five or six years, and they're really good with the kids. Some of the kids come back. Uh, they find out where we are the next year. They come back. They look for their favorite coach. You know, right, that right. gave him some. Uh, uh, Mr. Lott, now, I guess the same question to you about safety. Uh, and as a, as a successful player yourself, did you ever worry about getting speared or somebody putting that helmet in your guts? Well, I, I'm going to put it like this. If you play sports, you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a difference between getting hurt and being injured. And that is something that's been very, very important to myself. I had three sons. All three of my sons have played baseball, football, basketball, soccer. Just, I mean, we always played sports. I coached them all. And the reason I did start coaching with my oldest son is because I wanted to teach him how to do things the right way. Mm -hmm. And you cannot stop injuries they happen in freak incidents 
but what you can do is be smart about how you play a sport and how to take care of your body once something does happen. And these are the things that I emphasize with my players or athletes that I've had over the years. And also I've put together a coaching staff that I know are some of the best guys that have that know what they're doing, that understand we're on the same page when it comes to teaching and coaching. And these guys are guys that have played on the same level I have. So they have that understanding and knowledge. So it was very important to me to put this group of guys together. And I think that we're one of the best out there. I mean, OU, Tulsa, OSU, yes, they have very qualified coaches also. But these guys here that I have have played on a level where they understand also. Mm-hmm. And like Ms. Golden was saying, you know, it's very, it's, it's very expensive to, yeah. to be an athlete, especially today, especially a football player. Right. It costs a lot to buy equipment for parents. Mm-hmm. And now they've gotten where you feel like you have to go to all these different camps, which are very expensive. And we're putting, our, we're putting these kids and families in a position where they can go to a camp inexpensively and really learn something. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, Ms. Golden, if someone was interested in uh, more information or attending this camp, how do they get a hold of you? Well, the, they can go to the website for Muskogee Creek Nation. And um, when they pull down the information, they'll see the poster, and then they can get a registration form. The registration form, they complete it, they can fax it, they can mail it, or they can email it to me. And uh, they can also come on site. The locations are on the posters, so they can be there on site at 8 o'clock that morning and fill out their registration um, at any of the five sites. They are not limited to one camp. They can go to all three, all five of them if they want. Um, they. If they're non-Indian, they we ask them to pl- pay a five-dollar fee, okay. and that's primarily because of the the tribal funds. Right. Yeah. right. All right. Well, w- let me thank thank you, uh, uh, Sandra Golden and uh, Thomas Lott for making time to uh, to join us here on uh, Muskogee Radio and talk about uh, what could really be a fun opportunity for a lot of kids to uh, learn to play their favorite sports. And, gain a little education at the same time. So again, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, that's a wonderful opportunity for kids who are interested in playing these sports. Uh, We have uh, a number of uh, community announcements here to share with you right now, so let me uh, zip through as many as I can. Uh, First of all, it's Kelly Cup playoffs time, and you don't want to miss the action. The Tulsa Oilers head into the second round of the Best of Seven series this Sunday afternoon at the BOK Center. The fast-paced fun starts at 4.05 when the Oilers face off against the Idaho Steelheads. Nothing beats the hard-hitting intensity of playoff hockey. Buy tickets today by phone or text at 918-632-7825 or online at TulsaOilers.com. And don't miss the Kelly Cup playoffs with the Tulsa Oilers this Sunday night at the BOK Center. Uh, Muskogee Loan Fund is offering uh, uh, seminars to grow Oklahoma and get to know your perfect, perfect customer for uh, business people. The opportunity is uh, set up for the uh, May the th- uh, August the 9th will be the next one at the College of the Muskogee Nation, 918-549-2603. Okay, uh, Holdenville will be having its, uh, had its uh, May Arts and Crafts. Let's uh, get on to that. Uh, here's an important one. Gra- uh, calling all graduates for your profiles for uh, inclusion in the June 1st edition of the Muskogee News. The deadline is this Friday, May 10th, by 5 p.m. in order to be published in the 2019 Muskogee News Graduate Edition. And be advised, late profiles will not be accepted. May 10th, 5 p.m., that's it. Okay, uh, basket making with mom. We got uh, done that. Celebrate Mother's Day at the Council House. Basket making with mom Saturday the 11th from noon to 3. Bring your mom to in your life to the Council House Saturday, and artist Mary Smith will teach basket making on the lawn. Okay, finally, uh, 2019 Senior Games, the 31st. 
uh, at the uh, Omniplex. We'll have more on that later on. But let me say thank you for listening. We appreciate you uh, tuning in and joining us here for Muskogee uh, Radio. You've been listening to Muskogee Radio. Join us again next week for more local, tribal, and community news and updates. Madam.